Hey everyone, welcome to the Ooh. last episode. Woohoo! The last episode of Kitchen Party for 2014. Can we get a 2014? <laughs> we need some okay. of <laughs> That's right, that's right, that's right. Uh, for those of you who are tuning in for the first time, let me tell you how Kitchen Party works. Now, part of the equation of this is us on the panel talking and chatting and drinking a lot. Um, and the other half of this equation is you guys at home who are watching. So go and grab your cocktail. We'll wait. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to wait. Go grab your cocktail and come right back. And if you're watching on YouTube, make sure you subscribe to our channel, please. And then also you'll be the first to know when we have new episodes coming out. We won't have to bombard you with a million emails. And then also if you're watching on Twitter, Make sure you use the Kitchen Party hashtag to chat live with us. And if you're watching on Google+, hello, my friends. We love Google+. It's, without Google+, this show could not exist because Hangouts are um, sort of the bread and butter of the magic combination, the greatest recipe that makes Kitchen Party happen. Right, Renee? Absolutely. Absolutely. So this show, the episode today, is about trends, food trends for food bloggers, and also trends in tools and tips and things that we learned in 2014. And what are we going to focus on in 2015 to make really cool culinary content? Because your content is everywhere. Your content's on Twitter, Pinterest, Facebook. It's, it's just everywhere. And how do you sort of focus on what to focus on next year and how to make that um, really pay off for you in terms of your traffic and in terms of content and building community in a really organic way. Uh, my name is Babette Pepi. I'm one of the co-founders of uh, Kitchen Party. I am the founder of Bakespace.com, an online food community and uh, cookbook publisher. I'd like to introduce my co-host, Renee Lynch, the lovely, talented, beautiful co-host. Okay. Oh, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, you can talk anytime. I was, I was like, I'm running out of time. For every compliment. <laughs> well, you know what's funny? My cat in the background keeps like sneezing. So I, I'm trying to talk. Every time it sneezes, I'm like, I'll just say a word and they'll, they'll, they'll never hear it. Oh, keep going. <laughs> so, Renee, do you want to introduce yourself and tell the folks um, where they can find you online and um, what you're working on right now? Sure, absolutely. My name is Renee Lynch. I'm a writer and editor at the LA Times, and I work across a number of feature sections, including food and health, and I'm so happy to be here. This is Ooh. going to be a great topic. I'm looking forward to this. Looking forward what to are you drinking? Here. Sauvignon Blanc. I've switched over from Chardonnay. I'm going into the Sauvignon Blanc. Interesting. You know, we have a lot of alcohol left over from the wedding, but this is a, this is a concoction. This is a, it's vodka, cranberry juice, lemonade, but then... What I made from it that I really like is I got the flavored ice cubes. And so I have like lime flavored ice cubes and I was like, well, if it melts, then it melts. Um, let's start Let's start next with Sean. Sean, do you want to introduce yourself, tell the folks where they can find you, what you're working on right now? Sure. Uh, I'm Sean Timberlake, uh, blogger, writer, and founder of punkdomestics.com, uh, Twitter at punkdomestics. And it's a, a community site that's all about the DIY and food preservation area. And I'm also the food preservation expert for about.com. Oh, that's cool. Oh, cool. You have something in common with Nichelle. Oh, yeah? I'm also uh, an about.com expert. Oh, Cupcakes. great. Which topic? Cupcakes. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, Nichelle, this is a great... Uh, Progression, do you want to introduce yourself to the folks at home who are just learning about Cupcakes Take the Cake? Okay. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Nichelle Stevens, and I am the co-founder of Cupcakes Take the Cake. Um, I've been blogging about cupcakes for now 10 years. I started a blog with my friend Rachel in 2004. I'm also the local producer of Tech Munch in Atlanta. I was the co-producer of Tech Munch in New York, um, which is a food blogger conference that was founded by um, Babette. Excellent. Excellent. We're gonna we're gonna bring we're gonna bring it back to Atlanta this year, and I think New York as well. So you're gonna have to put some miles on your. Um... Oh yeah, I don't. I don't mind going. I, <laughs> I always wings. have a place to stay. <laughs> I have a place to stay. <laughs> now, Catherine uh, McCord is. Um, if you guys know Weelicious.com, um, first of all, you look amazing mm. in, in your webcam. I, every time I'm gonna have you on the show, I'm always like, oh man. <laughs> Man. I'm like, natural light, natural light. Nat <laughs> I'm like, how does she do it? How does she write about food? But then I'm thinking you write about you. Most of your stuff is children's food, like lunches. 
family food, like anything within the family food realm. So you have to keep it healthy. You have to keep it. We try, we try, but I mean, it, it, look, at the holidays, uh, there was a lot of ice cream and cookies and Bouche de Noel's in our world. <laughs> <laughs> so, Catherine, for the, the folks who are just learning about you, um, where can they find you online and what are you working on? Oh, gosh, um, online you can find me Wheelicious for everything, Instagram, Twitter, just Wheelicious. Um, right now I'm working on a show on the Food Network, so uh, it's called Guy's Grocery Games, and we just shot 10 episodes, we're about to shoot 46 all of January and February, so it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's on Sunday nights at 8 o'clock, and it's, it's a really fun, wild and crazy show. So are you a co-host? I am. I'm one of the judges. Um, so this is our it's our third season, and we're shooting season three, four, five, and six right now. Wow, three, four, five, and six. Boom, boom, yeah. boom. Yeah. So it's doing really well, and it's just it's a ton of fun. So um, that's one thing I'm working on, and working on a meal delivery um, company also, which is really fun because I mean the shopping, the menu planning, it's it's all too much for families. So we're going to bring the food to them. That would be fun to talk about how you took uh, your, you did your website, you converted it into a cookbook and you were able to kind of monetize it that way, but then also to be able to create these menu plans. Um, I think a lot of the folks at home are, just just the thought of how you came up with some of the ideas I think would be really cool to hear. You know, my cousin Karen has the hots for Guy. Like, unbelievable. <laughs> she, she's always like, you know who I think is the most handsome? I'm like, who? And she's like, Guy, I'm like, no way. <laughs> she, she, and she, she makes her husband sometimes dye his hair blonde. No way. <laughs> well, I will say he's a really good guy, pun intended. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's very good. Now, today's episode is about stuff that we learned in 2014, and also what we're going into 2015. So maybe we should start now. Sean, you wrote a blog post on the food trends that you hope like just die, die in 2015 that you don't want to see coming back. Do you mind sharing a couple of those, like especially if they're um, ones that you got a lot of feedback from your audience or from your readers? Sure. Uh, actually, I co-wrote it with uh, Christina McLean, Mouth from the South. And um, I had actually done the trend piece last year, and she did it two years ago. So between us, we've been sort of keeping an eye on all the different um, things that are going on out there. and sort of, you know, poking good-natured fun at the stuff that you see sort of done to death. And uh, it's currently, and has been for several days now, the most popular article on the site. So clearly it's struck a nerve with a bunch of people. <laughs> um, so among the things, one of the ones that was one of my biggest pet peeves is, for those of you in the baking space, covering an entire baked good with slices of citrus, raw citrus. I mean, it's pretty, but how do you eat that? I mean, it, I think form has to overtake function at some point, or vice versa. Um, so that was definitely one of my biggest pet peeves. And um, can you give me an uh, example? Of that? Like, would that be like an upside? Like a where, where would you see that? I'm trying. I'm trying to visualize that. I have seen cakes. I have seen <laughs> cheesecakes, and they just take tons and tons of slices of orange or lemon or whatever, and just like pile it all over the top. I'm like, <laughs> raw. So when and, you cut it, it's just flying off. And <laughs> yeah, exactly. How do you cut it? How do you eat it? It doesn't make any sense. Um, I've seen other examples where at least they candy the slices first so they become more edible, but still yeah. that's a really too much citrus for my palate. Um, also, I think one of the best ones that Christina called out was depressed food on Instagram because, you know, not one of those filters does any favors to food. <laughs> uh, I, that, that, that hashtag struggle plates. Have you seen that hashtag no. struggle plates? <laughs> People put that on Instagram. They'll post a picture of maybe some bad cooking or it just looks bad and they'll hashtag it. Struggle place. Struggle place. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> I'm going to aspire to get tagged with that now. <laughs> you bring up a good. You bring up a good uh, question or a good point about Instagram filters for food. Do any of you guys do anything to your food photos before you put them on Instagram? I use editing tools like I, now that I'm on um, the newest OS. I use the in-app uh, editing tools within the camera. Uh, but I've also used uh, some of the other ones out there, like uh, Snapseed. And I, I try to go for more realistic. I'm trying to bring out what's naturally there, good tone, good color, good contrast. I don't 
I don't like all the fancy filters, particularly for food. What about uh, Nichelle and um, Catherine? Well, I'm an Android person, so I don't have all that fancy stuff to begin <laughs> with. So I don't really use filters for food at all. I try to get it in good light. If I can't get it in good light, I just hope I got a good shot and just let it go. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm the same way. I mean, I took some pictures at the a farmer's market this morning, and um, I just had, like, one little bad shadow, and so I'll do that. But, I, you know, I totally agree. It's like you, you got to let the food show for itself. And, it's. I mean, look, let's be honest. When you're, you're shooting stroganoff, not so pretty. Maybe you don't get <laughs> it at all. It can be so intimidating, though. I feel like I do a lot of cooking, and I take a lot of food photos, but sometimes you just see the stuff that is just so highly stylized on Instagram, and I look at what I've put on a plate, and I swear it tastes good. My my husband will polish it off and ask for seconds, but you look at it, and you're like, ooh, that, that what did you call that, a struggle plate? It doesn't look like it. <laughs> my only trick is, I, um, and I think I actually learned this from Evie, I just chop up a whole bunch of parsley and throw parsley or chives. I'm like, I figure something green and bright will lighten up every, like stroganoff. That's what I would do. That would be my only trick. <laughs> and then I just go with it. But sometimes I just say I take a photo and I'm like, oh, I don't know if it's pretty enough for Instagram and I don't post it. <laughs> but, you know, there's so much great information out there. If you look at some of the other people who do really beautifully style blogs like Diane and Todd from White on Rice Couple, they're so generous sharing their information about how to make more beautiful food photographs. So they do entire on their um, Pinterest site. They do a whole board with little tips and pointers. They do panels. They do creative live sessions. So if you really want to up your game, there's certainly no shortage of information out there. What are your favorite um, pages to follow, like uh, either on Pinterest or on um, Instagram or Twitter? Do you guys follow the people because of their content? Do you follow it because their photos? Do you follow it because you already know them in person? Are you seeing are you seeing a different trend now? Now that kind of social media is a little bit more um, mainstream. Well, I have a Twitter list called Foodie Files that I've been using for years, and I add to it. That probably. we're all on it, right? Yeah, we're. Okay. <laughs> I just added Catherine, um, Sean. I will add you by the end of today. Um, but like when I meet people at Tech Munch or any kind of food blogger event. So I have that as a feed that I use on Hootsuite. So if I really just want to find out what people are talking about food-wise, I just follow that. And then when I get a chance, I will add them on Instagram. I honestly don't go on to Pinterest too much just to browse. I go on to Pinterest to post. So I don't get a chance to add as much on Pinterest as I do on Twitter and Instagram. I'm the exact same way with Pinterest. I it's like it's like a never ending stream. I just once I get stuck, I realize like, I'm not going anywhere. You know, it's a rabbit hole. It's a rabbit no. hole. I'm, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not doing anything. I, I'm not accomplishing anything. What am I doing? Um, but, it, but, so I just, it, but Pinterest is such a great way. Like I mean, we've been like redoing our house, and it's like to create boards around that, or like when I'm really through the year, like looking for holiday recipes or inspiration. It's so nice having those boards, and then you know your, you, the people you admire. Like I'm much more aspirational on Pinterest than I am at Instagram. Because I usually follow people I like or know on Instagram, but Pinterest is like a different level of that in, you know, aspiration. Absolutely. I think that's, that's a yeah. really good way to, to put it. I find, though, that I can get on Pinterest and I, suddenly I'm like, wait, three hours have gone by. What has happened? What? <laughs> <laughs> of course, that's during office hours, right, Renee? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, no, sometimes I can actually argue that I'm doing some work on Pinterest, but <laughs> in reality, I'm like, totally fooling around. <laughs> you guys are crazy. We did get, I want to make sure everyone knows at home that if you have any questions for the, for the, um, our friends who are in the chat today, uh, you can use the hashtag kitchen party. Uh, Renee, are you going to be following yep. the Twitter chat? Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Renee's following that. I'm following the Google Plus page where you can post as well. And we got a whole bunch of questions. I want to make sure we get to them. Um, I think it's, did you say Sean? Her, her name is Teresa. 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 Teresa gave us like eight amazing questions that I think will be awesome. So I want you to know we're going to be getting to those very shortly. Um, what else, Sean, was on your list so that we can we can round out 2014 and now and then we can look forward to 2015. <laughs> 
Um, another great one, I think, is the recipes with more than 15 flavors and or words in the title. Like, when you just pile on too much stuff, keep it simple, keep it clean. Uh, and speaking of clean, no more dribbling things over the sides of bowls and, and pitchers and things like that. It's just gross. <laughs> Sean, I'm going to totally disagree with you. I love messy. <laughs> <laughs> I love messy too, but not when it's deliberate, you know. <laughs> All right, I'm going to give you that one. I'm going to give you that one. <laughs> I, I could just see, like, the tutorial of, like, you know, how to add a drip on the side of your bowl. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it is an eye dropper, yeah. Like, Sean, I do think you're totally right. I, I'm, I'm just giving you a hard time because you can see when it's just like this perfect, delicious little drip, and you're like, I know the pot pie did not come out of the oven exactly like that. I know the fudge did not drip over exactly like that. It was definitely the help of an eyedropper. So right, I'm with right. you on that one. <laughs> now, have you guys seen Catherine's uh, uh, lunch? Like, I don't know if I wouldn't call them, would I call them bento, bento boxes? Yeah, they're bento okay. boxes. Yeah, bento boxes. Um, have you guys seen those? Renee, have you seen those? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. On Instagram. Yeah, and I'm always amazed. What What is the most popular, like, when you start posting those on um, Instagram, what gets people's attention? What makes them comment or like? Is there a certain fruit mm -hmm. or a certain design? I think, well, it's, it's probably, I mean, it's, it's such a great question. I mean, I've been taking a picture of my kids' lunch since they were two and a half, so five years, five years every day since... For the past five years, um, and I mean, literally, I make them in twenty minutes because I mean, as I'm, a, there's no pre-planning. But I think that when it's things like when dragon fruits in season, you know, when you get those, when they're really colorful and people see it, but like I, I can make this. It's just chopped. You know, it's just a chopped fruit. It just has like really incredible colors. Um, I think that that's when they're, you know, then when they like them. I think that when I, I don't do origami lunch because I don't have time to do origami lunch. But um, you know, I think that at least like the Wheelicious lunches that like you can do them. So those are the ones that are like you know, more fun and get more likes, I guess. Do you ever get people? They're like, what is that? Oh yeah, there's a lot of what is that. <laughs> Do you guys? Yeah. Like, yeah. Sorry, I'm sorry. What were we gonna say? Well, no, I was gonna say usually I let my kids tell what it is, but <laughs> you know, I mean, but that's really just people that they they happen you know upon to. But the funny thing is that two of their teachers I've found out in recent days will literally go to their classrooms and be like, the, the, one of them they said. I went to their classroom and they had that lunch that day. I was like, "Do you think that I'm?" There's no pre-planning here. <laughs> they thought it was like I was just like taking pictures and throwing it away. That is hysterical. We really, we really eat it. Now, Nichelle, because most of the content that you guys produce are you guys do articles and then you find cupcake stuff that's on the web and then you re um, repost it. How are you finding some of your content? Um. Well, I think I find a lot of it through, um, actually through Flickr, through Instagram. Um, sometimes people tweet at us like, oh, a bakery would tweet us what they made or some of their specials. Um, I kind of have a Google alert on cupcakes, but it's kind of useless because the word is just used too much. So, too many um, things. <laughs> yeah, it's too many things. Um, so I pretty much find things because if someone wants to tell me about something that they think will work for Cupcakes Take the Cake. In fact, like a new uh, bakery opened up in Brooklyn, I guess, a couple of weeks ago. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that heads open. So I'll probably find someone who will write about it. So, so uh, tell me how you use, um, how you mine Flickr. That seems interesting. Oh, because Flickr before was around before Instagram and all the other ones. I created a Flickr group for Cupcakes Take the Cake in 2005. So um, there are maybe 8,000 Flickr members in that group, and wow. they'll just post photos. And I'll look on the Flickr group and see if there's any photos that I want to repost. Some of them are from bloggers, so they'll have a photo and a link. Some of them are food photographers. Some of them are bakers. So it's a it's a mix. It's not all um, 
bloggers like myself. So actually, that's that's one of the main sources that's been around for a long time, at least for me. Um, I can't. I I don't. I don't even know how many photos are in that Flickr group. I think it might be like a hundred thousand photos. I mean, it's just been around for so long. Wow, Michelle. <laughs> As part of the community, like people who opt into the community, that gives them that gives you permission to then repost their photos, or do you have any permissions there that work? Yeah, actually, the thing is, sometimes people join the group, and then they give they I'll add that photo to the group, but then I can't post it, and they don't know. I don't think they know that they they haven't given me permission because I put on. I put on the summary of the site that of the Flickr group that we will be posting and we'll credit you because that's what we do. We t we link back, so that's not a problem. But I kind of don't worry about it most part because that doesn't happen that often. And then I mean, honestly, there's always so many pending photos that I'm like, I'll just get the ones I can get and then move on. <laughs> and if yeah. someone ever asks me why they're not doing it, then I'm like, oh, because you your permissions are set so that I can share it. Ah, uh, I think. Mm -hmm. Michelle, right, one question. Mm -hmm. What's what's in thin cupcake icing or thick cupcake icing? Because I just went by Crumbs about an hour ago, and they're back in business. No more bankruptcy. And I saw that thick icing, and I thought of you. Um, I think they're the exception. Um, I don't know what it is in California, but in, when I lived in New York, they had to list their calorie counts in. For some people, that kind of was like, I oh my can't, god, <laughs> I can't, I can't eat them. I honestly think that um, what is actually in is more like layered, um, like those cupcakes in a jar. They're almost like trifles with the cake mm -hmm. and the frosting or the filling, and then the cake and then the cake, uh, the cake again. You know, I think that is a big trend. I don't think the I don't think frosting is going to get too high, other than things like those high hats that uh, Trophy Cupcakes has in Seattle, which is great. It says this um, high hat, and they'll have like this hard, like um, almost like that magic shell, like that mm -hmm. candy shell. But I think they probably use, you know, coconut oil and chocolate. But anyway, other than that, I don't think high frosting is going to be in because people really like good cake. Don't mm -hmm. let frosting, you know, you know, you know, fool you. People really like good cake, and that's what's going to keep cupcake places in business: is good cake, not you, great frosting. Do you think that the heavy frosting is to make the cupcake appear heavier, <laughs> so that you're like when you're like, I just took home my 425 cupcake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it might be the whole um, yeah <laughs> value for your buck because one and one and I think as far as the trend is. Desserts are never going to go away, but I think people are really paying attention to all the books about the dangers of sugar, and I think they're saying, this is an indulgence, so if I'm going to indulge, I better get something I really like that's really worth it. So maybe there might be these extreme desserts, but I think, if anything, people are just going to be more focused on quality desserts. We, we, we had Valrona chocolate cupcakes last night, and my daughter ate all the icing and handed me the cake. I was like, here, mommy. <laughs> it was good. I it was love good. We did. We did get a. We got a tweet on. Uh, we got a tweet from Mary Beth Hunt who says, "I disagree with Sean Timberlake too. Mm -hmm. it's party. I'll take my photos any way I want." <laughs> <laughs> Rock on! I, love that. I say, do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so before we switch to, because we're going to switch to some of these questions, um, anything you did this year that you learned from that you're not going to be doing next year? Like it could be anything. It could be editorial calendars. It could be mm. posting. Five, you know, five times a day, whatever it is that's sort of re related to publishing food content. What, what's one thing that you probably may not do that you learned? Maybe it wasn't su such a good idea. Less time on Facebook. <laughs> I feel like Facebook has ruined, just taken away from so many people within the, the industry, the business, the, the people that are just like coming to Facebook or food bloggers or and it's just like they've you, with only being able to see 10% of the traffic it feels like it's just sometimes it's not worth it that's something that we're really struggling with at the paper um, it, it, it's almost like is that where you should put your emphasis or should you 
put your emphasis on you know Twitter and Instagram like as we're advising people on what to help because uh, I help coach people on social media what do you put your focus on and in some ways I kind of feel like Facebook is cutting its own throat yeah like, I agree I feel like if I'm going to help somebody build brands, I tell them you got to focus on Twitter and Instagram and Google Plus and Pinterest yeah, I'm it's such a bummer. Yeah. It is such a. If it feels such like, especially for new people getting into the business, it used to be just such a great way for people to find single recipes or to chime in, um, just like visual plus that you could write. And now it's just if you can't see the content, what you know, it's really hard, tough. Michelle, what about you? What's what's one thing you're going to be changing? Um, one thing, and this is something as, I guess, as a veteran blogger, I'm, I'm going back to doing, but as someone who's new to blogging, I would say go back when you have time to add, um, add all the relevant tags to your posts, because I didn't do that back in the day, and it's a long project, but every once in a while I'll just go back and look at some old posts and add you know the tags um, even changing some of the titles because I'm really trying to work on my SEO without hiring someone to do it because I get solicitations from people all the time and I'm not gonna do that but really just take note of how someone can find your content and the tagging which is something that didn't start with blogging and because of Twitter and Instagram you can really find things and now you can you go back and do the same kind of work for your blog post. I like that. Renee, what about you at the paper? You know, um, I, I, I feel like uh, Catherine hit on it. Like it's really trying to help people, um, help reporters and uh, writers build their own brands and doing, figuring out what is their niche. We have some people who are very, very successful on Facebook and the advice is of course, if that's where a lot of your audience uh, in, interacts with you and engages with you, then you should stick with that. But um, for, for people who are kind of like just diving in or, or relatively new to this, um, I think it really is finding the niche that works for you, but also that you enjoy most. Um, that you really feel like, this is not work. This is like, I will sit there and just play around on Twitter and Instagram or Pinterest because I enjoy it. And for some people, I feel like Facebook can feel like, you know, you post something and who knows if anybody has seen it and and it's just it's just too difficult. So I feel like in some ways, um, for social media, it we're we're opening things up a bit. And I don't think that people should feel like they have to be on 17 platforms. Exactly, they should be where they want to be and really build a community there. And by building a community, it's just like having fun and engaging with people. I think that um, that we're going to see hopefully see a lot of that at the at the newspaper. And I think that's what social media is about, like where you're enjoying it and you're having fun, not, you know, I must post every day on Google Plus or Instagram or Twitter. It should be where you're, where do you like being most of all and finding audience there and engaging with them. You know, I, I agree and I disagree because I agree that it, that would be awesome and wonderful and great and so it, may, it warms my heart. But I feel like if I don't post, if it, it's like I could work all day and post to Instagram, I could post to Twitter, I could post to whatever. One person posts to Pinterest and they get like all this traffic that then they can it's like that's a metric that people actually see as opposed to just being like well I had a really great conversation with you know 50 people on Instagram today but no one sees that traffic that's related to me because that traffic just kinda goes somewhere so another, I feel another really good one is Yumly I and mean, we're seeing Yumly being as high as Pinterest oh so, wow wow yeah. So if you, you make sure, uh, and the way that also with them is you have to if you create your own page and post your own recipes, and then they all filter in. It used to be that mm. immediately they would take your library; it could all be filtered in. Now it has to be done one by one. But Yumly is another really great. Um, I, I wouldn't say up and coming. I think it's already past that. But yeah, um, yeah. another great traffic source for recipes. Oh, great! Oh, well, I actually know the founder thing. of that. Cool. Uh, Michelle and Sean, do you have any other suggestions or platforms like Yumly that we yeah, should look at? And, and actually, Catherine, if you have any others? Yeah, um, there's one call, I think it's called Cucumber Town. 
<laughs> and it has it has it's similar it, the 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 UX is so similar to Medium and that it makes it real easy for you to post uh recipes. Like I, I really like it. I really like it. It is Cucumber Town. And I found it and and I kind of geek out sometimes with the tech startup stuff, but I found that I found it through Product Hunt. I like to go on the Product Hunt sometimes and just look for the food um, startups. So I found um, Cabbage, not Cabbage Town. Cabbage Town is a neighborhood <laughs> in Atlanta. Cucumber Town <laughs> is um, is the site. <laughs> Now, guys, I want to make sure we get to um, the questions before the okay. end of the show because our show will end. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna read these questions, and they're totally out of um, they they don't make any sense together. But if but it, when you're when you're in content, they, they you know they make sense. So we're gonna kind of bounce around a little bit. There is one question I had early on, which was um, where is that question? Ah, uh, I don't see the I don't see the question, but I know it was a question of how do you pick your trends going forward? Do you create an editorial calendar on what you think is going to be interesting, or do you create an edit or do you pick your like do you read somewhere that oh Bon Appetit or somebody has a really cool idea? Um, you, the cucumbers are like the 2015 thing. That's a lie. I don't know if that's true. Um, do you then look at your editorial calendar and say, how can I put those things in seasonally? Or do you create an editorial calendar and then just find content and create content that matches that over the year because you think it's timely? Does that make sense? Well, for, for me, since preserving is so seasonal in its nature, I have the benefit of being able to look back on almost five years of uh, data with the site and see when things peak. And so I can think ahead, like, okay, we're coming into winter, so obviously I'm not going to be talking about fruit, except maybe apples and a lot of citrus. Uh, but now is the time to start talking about lactofermentation, cabbage, you know, all that winter uh, produce. And uh, that will carry me through the winter. And then as the fruits start to come up, you know, trying to keep on track with that. Now, I live in Northern California, so we get a lot of stuff a lot earlier than the rest of the country. And in the spring, that works to my benefit because I can start building content that's going to become timely in the East Coast, you know, three to six weeks later. So that's, uh, that's generally how I go about it. Um, on Wheelicious, I'm, I'm like Sean, I just, whatever seasonal and just sort of whatever inspires me, either at the market um, or just ideas. But on YouTube, I'm my, um, I've done an original video every Tuesday for seven and a half years. And wow. this year, I'm, yeah, there's a lot of content. <laughs> um, but so this year, I'm doing a, a little bit different. And I've done an editorial calendar around everything from holidays to movies coming out. Um, because I think with YouTube, especially, it's just really, really topical. And it's easier to track sort of food trends. That is really interesting how you're doing uh -huh. your editorial calendar. <laughs> that uh -huh. is very interesting because we do, we do a lot of branded content with films and TV shows, but it's usually like an ad buy where they'll come to us and they'll say, uh, you know, um, whatever movie it is, Julie and Julia or um, uh, Food is Where, um, oh my God, I always mess up this Disney title we just did, <laughs> Food Brings You Home. Uh, you know, it's like, you, not food brings you home. What is the heck of that name, Renee? Forget it. Don't listen to me. But I'm just saying, when I look at that stuff, they'll come to me and they'll say, we want to do something, and then I'll create the content. And I constantly always feel like I'm behind the eight ball trying to catch up to the opportunities as opposed to, like, looking at the Baker calendar. That's genius, by the way. I have to... We'll have to I, talk. And, and some of it feels like, it, and uh, Babette, I was just looking, it is Food Brings You Home. Um, okay, I, good. <laughs> <'Cause I was> like, <laughs> no, you, had it, you had it right the first time. That's what we called the contest. So I was like, <laughs> is that what we called the contest? Is that the movie of the film? In, in, in some ways it feels like it's like a little bit of, a little bit of both, right? Like it, 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 it's, like, it's almost like plan, but also be ready to jump in and do something at the last minute, right? Yeah, it's, absolutely. It's not always uh, one or the other. Um, I wanted uh, to just mention, I'm sorry, I just wanted to mention something uh, on uh, Twitter. Chef uh, Demetra Overton says, I'll go back and tag Instagram posts to increase engagement, thanks to what uh, Cupcake Blog said. And uh, oh, yeah. Mary Beth Hunt said, 
I agree with uh, Michelle. I hate cupcake frosting. Just a glaze for me. <laughs> All right, so let me get to the next question. Now we're going to go through tr uh, tr Trace's questions. Our first question is, and we have about 25 minutes. Oh, not 25 minutes. We have about 20. No, we have about 20, 20 minutes for the rest of the show. So we have eight questions. So we. If you don't think you can answer this question, don't answer it. But if you have some really cool insight, definitely please let us know. Um, what What's your takeaway? What's your take on giveaways? Do they bring actual readers or just clicks to your site? It's a win and a free low cost advertising for the product. But what is the win for you? Okay, I got I got this something to add. No. I do. <laughs> I do giveaways and I feel like it's more of a treat for my readers. Um, I use raffle copters to make it easier but it really doesn't do that much for me. <laughs> um, I think the only time it really does is sometimes because I'll make a requirement that people like our Facebook page or Twitter so I may get an uptick in those count follower counts but other than that I just feel like I'm doing something for my readers. Anyone else want to add to that? Totally agree. We do them like I do them like three times a month, and it's funny to see the things that are um, more organic to the viewer. Or you know, sometimes I love something and it doesn't get you know a ton. Or some things that I'm like, eh, and just huge, huge, huge traffic you know off of it. Um, so I think it's worth it though because everyone loves something free. Everyone loves a giveaway. And as long as you're not asking them to do too much, like that's my thing, is like I don't want people to have to like a hundred things or, you know, like that it's just not even worth it, you know, not get another ten emails. It, it should be something that just simple. Yeah, I think you don't get lasting traffic from it, but sometimes there is upside. First of all, it's really interesting to see what people respond to, you know, what performs better than others. And there are some ways to... Um, to get some gains from it. Like one of the options I usually put in for giveaways is to sign up for my newsletter. So yes. it helps me incrementally grow my list. And that's the one thing, you know, because social and Google, you have no control over the rules there, but at least with email, that's your list and you get to do what you want with it. Do you guys find that email, like, is gonna, like 2015 is going to be the year of email? We're going to go back? Of newsletters, yeah. Yeah, mm. I think so. Yeah, I, I think newsletters are getting... Um, they're getting some traction, um, and and you could you got an audience that opt in, and I think you can do a lot with that. Anyone else want to add to that? We let's just uh, Catherine. Do you guys do a newsletter? Oh, you do do a newsletter. I think I'm I subscribe to your newsletter. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Yes, I do, yes, I do a newsletter every. I mean, I post about four or five times a week, so you can do it for every day, every week. Weekend, yeah. Do you guys find that next year you'll be posting more content or you'll be posting less? I mean, I try to do, here, I, I'm sort of, you know, I think that the market is incredibly saturated right now, the food blogging market. So I think that if there's anything I'm feeling for 2015, it's that I'm not going to, I just really try to be super selective. I, I don't like to waste people's time. So if it's a recipe that's important to me or a giveaway, you know, I, I don't just like want to send an email to send a newsletter, you know. I totally agree. I'm, okay, so we got another question. When it comes to recipes on your blog, do you tend to favor more generalized dishes, something for everyone, or do you aim for a niche sector and focus uh, and feature dishes that are less known, fulfilling in need? Hmm. Who wants to answer that one? For me, it's both. I mean, I'll go ahead because I think that um, especially if you love a certain blog, food blogger, you trust them. So, you know, their buttermilk waffle recipe, as classic and maybe boring as that is, is going to go into the repertoire. But, like, you know, they're, then, like, Sean was talking about, like, mashups, you know, like, you're willing to try the meatloaf meatballs because you, that sounds fun and it's, you know, maybe a little bit more out there. Um, but I think that, you know, for, I think that for a lot of food bloggers, I mean, especially if you're like a really an authentic cook and you just love cooking, it's whatever inspires you. Sometimes, you know, 
Um, you may not be on trend or seasonal, but if it's something that you really love and worked for you, then it's it's great to be able to share it with your audience. We just had um, Floyd Cordoz, the a chef, on the show a few weeks ago, and he was talking about how he takes typical foods, so like waffles or chicken or anything like that, and he adds the spice that makes it unique. So it's mm. It, it makes people feel comfortable, like they're eating something that they are familiar with, but that the spice is what changes the flavor. And he said that's really, it helps you open up um, pe people's imagination. Uh, so if you want to like introduce something, like if your blog is only about waffles or something like that, um, maybe that's how you can add a little bit more uh, variety to it, where it's not just the same buttermilk waffles, even though I'm... I'd be a fan anyway, but uh. <laughs> well, he also did a wonderful example with that Babette. He did a, a Babette had him do a live demo where he took a Brussels sprouts recipe, and the preparation of the Brussels sprouts was relatively, uh, maybe not as precisely traditional, but he shaved them so it was like kind of thin ribbons of um, Brussels sprouts, and then he he kind of tweaked the did kind of an Indian infusion to the. Seasoning, so it was kind of a dish that was not too far out of, of tradition for people, but added a little something, and I thought that was just absolutely brilliant, right? Like if people want to try a little something different, so maybe uh, Babette, you can tweet out that uh, show later so we can share. Oh yeah, you might want to see that. Absolutely, so that was a great de demo. He did a great job of he was chopping and cutting and doing all this stuff, and suddenly we had this amazing, amazing Brussels sprouts dish. You know, speaking of videos, do you guys find, now Catherine, you do videos every week. Um, what about the rest of you guys? Are, are you guys doing videos as well? Or are you thinking about doing videos? I know, Nichelle, you were doing Hangouts for a while. Yeah, I did a couple of Hangouts. Um, I would love to do videos. Um, I just haven't figured out how to do it on a regular basis. Um, and if I can, I will eventually in the future. And maybe... It may, maybe it's about decorating, or it, or it could be more about um, flavors, or you know, like talking about just vanilla or something like that. So I don't know. I, I once I figure out what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna put it come on my over, calendar. Come over, come over, come <laughs> over. I invite you to come do one with me anytime you want. <laughs> I love a cupcake master in the house. My kids. <laughs> Like bowing to you. <laughs> and, and, and listen, I can come up and be your official taster. There you go. <laughs> I am so wanting to come to California. I have not. Be, I haven't been since I judged a mini cupcake thing in like f five years ago. Well, it'll be five years. Come on. Like 2010, okay. the last time I was in. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, Renee, Renee and I will be like, oh, can we just <laughs> <that's> <laughs> So we got that's a good question. Help. <laughs> we, we got a good question about sponsors. This is kind of cool. Working with, because I think a lot of bloggers are trying to figure out, a lot of content creators, I mean, you can have your Vine video sponsored, your Instagram, I mean, it's just, it's, it's insane. It's insane what is happening now. It says, working with sponsors, how do you talk about their product without sounding like a putz? I haven't figured this out yet. That's a great question. Great question. Um, I'll tell you, I'm super brand specific, so for me, it, it's like it's got to be something that I would use in my house, and it's tough. I mean, there's it's because like for us, we won't use anything with GMOs, you know, no corn syrup. Um, so you know, it really it's a bummer because for a lot of brands, like big money brands, if you if you're not going to use the products, then you know, do you really want to work with them? But if you will, and if you're like, this is something I would totally use, that I think is um, what makes it authentic. If, if you love it, your voice will come across naturally. This is something that's always been sort of a huge problem from punk domestics because, of course, it's all about scratch, you know, like it's all about whole ingredients, root ingredients, and nothing, it's all about taking back what, from what's on the shelf in the grocery store. So. Um, I don't do sponsored posts on punk domestics other than, you know, giveaways, things like that. Uh, but what about I think tools? Right. Like what, what about like the jars and stuff? Could you, could you focus Absolutely. on that? Absolutely. And, and Jardin Brands, Ball and Kerr, I invite you to give me a call anytime you want. <laughs> 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 um, we can make that happen. <laughs> actually, I was going to say that I think what, to get, uh, Catherine's point, if there's a brand that you're using, as opposed to waiting for them to come to you, you go to them and say, 
I love you guys and um, I have this audience and I would love to do some stuff with you. So I think that would be a good way to do that. Yeah, I mean, I, a lot of, like, even for the lunches, like, I go to Whole Foods, Trader Joe's, I go and just buy things, and then I'll put them in lunch, and I, um, if it's a brand, like, I really love, like, I love Mary's Crackers, not that I've worked with them, but, you know, I tweet them out, and then they'll respond to me, you know, sometimes it, 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 if you're, you know, if you're really blogging a lot, like, and you're using the products a lot, that, that for a brand, even if you're small, that, that for them is, like, it's a really, it's important, because every, Ten voices you have is ten voices that might be listening to you know that brand. I absolutely agree. Since we're since we have limited time, I w I'm going to move forward. But I would love to have an entire conversation on sponsorship. So you guys are going to be invited back, and we're going to go we're going to dive deeper into that. Okay, <laughs> point number four. Do you publish on a schedule a particular day, and do you post according to an editorial calendar? I do. I like to pretend I do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not going to pretend I don't. <laughs> yeah, it, it helps so much. I mean, especially when you're trying to, you know, I, I, I sometimes I cook on days because it's because I have kids and I, this is the way it has to be. But it's it's great. I'll just go to the market and get like totally inspired. Come home, do like three, four, five dishes, and then you know add it to the calendar, and it just makes it it just makes it a lot more a lot easier. That's what you should call them, Renee. To do their cooking day. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I just trying to totally cut you off. I was just going to say to um, Catherine, that's when she should call Renee and I over to pick up the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I do that? I go to Smart and Final and I have containers, all these containers, and I take them to school to the, my kids' teachers. Like, Don't I waste have, them on the youth. <laughs> I have a lot of food. Sean, I'm sorry I cut you off. What were you saying? I was just saying I know a lot of other bloggers who do that thing where it's like one day of the week is the cooking day. And that's the day they commit to doing dishes for a week's worth of content at least, and that way they kind of get ahead of it. When when you guys are this is this is not a question on here, but this made me think of this. When you are doing that, when you're actually creating your recipes or you're creating something, how are you thinking of your how are you thinking of where you're posting your different elements to this content? So mm -hmm. when like when you're cooking, do you post do you post live to Instagram or do you save the pictures and then post it to match when the blog post goes live? How are you optimizing that? For me, it's all um, in amount of time I have, like days I'm cooking. Like if something just looks awesome, I'll be like, oh my god, I'm going to take a picture and post it now. I wish there was a lot more thought process that went into it because then there's some days that I do that and then three weeks later when I post the recipe, um, I'm like, oh, right, I already did that picture, you know, or you're ticking people off by being like, oh, here's this yummy thing, and they're like, oh, great, where is it? I'm like, oh, you're going to have to wait three weeks, sorry. So either, <laughs> sometimes it's a lose-lose. <laughs> I'm jealous that you post, like, you make things three weeks in advance. <laughs> That's a miracle. No, I, I mean, but I, I'm like, I'm like crazy, like, I'll just like start cooking, and you know, I, I constantly am ahead because I, you know, you get excited. Uh. Now, Nichelle, do you, do you, you, you said you don't post to an editorial calendar? No, I mean, the closest thing I use is um, I check on Foodimentary to see what some of the food holidays are, and then I can find some content relating to some of those food holidays. So I don't really have an editorial calendar. So, I mean, I'll post, like, I'll put on a calendar, like, giveaways so I know when to post them and when to, you know, announce the winner and stuff like that. So it's more housekeeping for me, but not mm. as much as like a theme. Um, but cool. I keep saying I'm gonna do it. Maybe this year will be the year. I do. <laughs> <laughs> this is the year. I, <laughs> this will be the year. <laughs> you guys are hilarious. Let me let me get to the fifth question. So okay, are you exploring food related topics outside of recipes? It seems that 99% of food blogs focus exclusively on recipes. But the food world itself is a much better, is much larger than that. I'm surprised more people don't explore outside of recipes. Now, I think that's because people are Googling recipes. I think that's you're able to kind of get a low-hanging fruit. What What are you guys doing? Are you focusing on other kind of content? I mean, Nichelle, I know you do. Yeah, 
And I think a lot, I mean, I think that 99% thing is a little high. A lot of people are searching for food, and a lot of them are searching for restaurants, grocery stores, ingredients. It's not just recipes. Um, there's some of them are so focusing on food trends, like what we're talking about. So um, I think if you're looking at food or you're writing about food, you, you're going to get to a point where you're going to look at the whole ecosystem, like even, you know, farmers or like Catherine said, she went to the farmer's market. So I don't, I don't think it's just going to be about recipes. You're going to incorporate all of that content in. I mean, even for Wheelicious, like I do, I have a whole different side, which is Wheelicious Menus, which is a subscription-based service. So like a lot of Wheelicious and Wheelicious Menus, it's not just the recipes, because I think that that's all just like food porn eye candy. It's actually how do you menu plan? Like how do you figure it all out that you can make the food and, you know, timing and all that. So I think menu planning is really a, a trend we're going to keep seeing just because it's, you know, it's it's time. It's just how do you get food on the table and not end up with, like, fast food or, you know, whole foods or prepared food. For me, since I started doing the about.com thing, it's afforded me the chance to dig a little deeper into the issues of, around preserving, like, why do you have to do that, or why can't you do that? Or, you know, what's the whole scientific reason behind the various things that are out there? And, and of course, the very important issues, because there's a lot of food safety involved. Um, but that's been really rewarding for me to dig deep and to get some information and share it out there in the world in a way that uh, will inform people so they can be more confident when they're doing preservation in the home. Yeah, so I, I just want to oh, take you back on some of those answers because we're finding that people are really driven by uh, technique. You know, uh, we're just one of our most popular recipes of the year was um, it, it was a, 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 a story that Russ Parsons, our food editor, did on preparing beans without doing kind of that long soaking process. I mean, mm -hmm. that story continues to give over and over again, and it's not really a recipe story. It's really about preparing beans for whatever recipe you might be using. So I think that it's interesting that all three of you are hitting on kind of the same thing. It's like almost like a how-to, a technique, a behind the scenes that people are very intrigued by. It's funny, I just did, did a thing on canning dry beans and it's performing really well. Everyone got really on board with it. It's, it's kind of crazy. Beans are the new protein. Yeah. <laughs> beans are the new beef. <laughs> Beans are the new beef. That's funny. <laughs> um, now here's here's a couple more questions. Now it's four o'clock. Now this is when we said our show would end. Do you guys have like five more minutes, ten more minutes to be on the show? Sure. Yeah. Okay. I want to make sure you guys know your time is valuable. Um, here's another one. I've heard there's been a sharp decline in commenters on blogs. Is that true for yours? Um, how do you keep the conversation going with your readers? I think that's a great question. Mm. Great question. Uh, you heard. Yeah, always, if someone leaves a comment, comment back. And and I think keep the question, like you said, keep it going, um, asking questions to your readers. It's not just always being the answer, but um, especially like on YouTube, I'll ask people like what they want or what did you like about this that you, know, you would want something different or similar. I've said many times to many people that we are living in the post-blog era not meaning that blogs are dead, but that it used to be that your blog was the core of your online existence, and now it's just part of a much bigger tapestry that involves all of social media. So what it really means is that um, you need to find where the action is, where the engagement is, and follow that. And sorry, the doorbell just rang. My dog went bonkers. <laughs> hey, Chuck, what, what kind of dog do you have? She's a little terrier, 17-pound, black and tan. Aww. Aww. We, we're big dog fans here, so. <laughs> if you want the dog to come into the room, that's totally fine. We'll, we'll, okay. we'll deal with that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, let's get to another question. Um, outside, oh, how do you guys handle spam comments? This is delayed. totally a separate. You delayed? Delayed <laughs> market spam. <laughs> Do you guys use any custom tools for like making sure that you have less spam to comments that are happening? I have two things. I have a plugin called Mollum. I'm on Drupal though. I'm not on um, WordPress. Ooh, fancy. I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> uh, and then I also, not for commenting, but for other things like registration and submissions, I have a special CAPTCHA plugin that's image-based because 
all the other ones that I had tried, spammers were able to get through it, and this one is impenetrable, so. Nice. Okay. I like that. Um, okay, here's a question. Outside of yourself, who else is involved in producing your blog? Do you outsource any element of it, tech, photography, editing, editing etc.? Um, I will, on occasion, um, outsource um, people to blog write blog posts about things that are local to them and we have some cupcake correspondents I mean we actually have someone <laughs> who will write things and they live in Kansas City um, and we used to have someone who um, who lived in London who would send us posts but then um, Betsy who runs Java Cupcake she'll post on our site so um, some content but that's about it What about the other, what about everyone else? And I know, Renee, you have writers all the time, but are they all staff writers? You know, we have actually very few freelancers. Um, as the budgets have tightened and tightened over time, uh, we have a handful of freelancers that we turn to, but mostly it's staff writers. And Catherine, do you do all your stuff? Everything is you? I mean, I do all the writing, all the writing and photography and testing and blah, blah, blah. I have someone help me in the kitchen on testing days just because it's like dish city here. So, you know, for, the, for yeah, for volume. You know, you just brought up a good point. I hate dishes. It's like the thing I hate more than anything in the world. I should do a, like, cooking thing and then make an excuse and be like, well, we need someone here to wash the dishes when I'm done prepping my stuff. Now, I... I no, I've had some. I've had someone for five years, and I, three people, and I get them from the culinary schools because uh, culinary school kids want to, you know, have experience in the kitchen, and you learn a lot from food bloggers because we're doing so many different types of things. That's really cool. Like, that's a good yeah, idea. to be in like a restaurant kitchen, so it's really fun, and you know, they get to be creative too. Hmm. That's yes, hire somebody to do those dishes, Bobette. You're I know, every problem. day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I hate them so much. Okay, here's question number eight. What's your best advice for someone who wants to start a food blog? What do you wish you knew before you started? <laughs> Buy your own domain name as soon as you know what it's going to be. <laughs> Buy it. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> now, Nichelle, was your domain name available when you started your blog, or was it? I didn't even think about looking for it. <laughs> but I started my when I started Cupcake Take the Cake. Well, actually, R Rachel started it, but um, she had also started a comedy blog and a contest blog around the same time. So there's no way we were going to be buying domain names. I was still working as a risk management consultant full time back then. So, but it, at one point it was available, and um, I didn't buy it. And then, and now I think it might be available, but now it costs too much. So, mm. but yeah, buy your domain name. From my personal blog, Hedonia, you know, same thing. Would that I have bought the domain however many years ago, because now some domain squatters on it, and they want nine thousand dollars for it. I'm like, oh. yeah, no. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, whatever, I would research all of them and just make sure whatever domain you choose, you can get across every platform. Because Definitely. if you're like, you know, cat cat on everything, and then all of a sudden Instagram cat cat's taken, it's just, it's not, it's not worth it. We, we just had a really funny thing where um, somebody, I had it before, I don't know why it lapsed, but it was bakespace.org. And I got it because I thought if I ever do any nonprofit stuff, and somebody took it, like somebody registered it. Not only that, they registered Bake Space with a an underscore on Twitter, but it's like it's this bakery in Germany, and it's like this crazy, <laughs> it's like this crazy thing where, I, like, I send a message to their people, like, hey, this is like our trademark, because when they reply on Twitter, they don't have to put the underscore in their name, so their handle is Bake underscore Space. But their name says Bake Space. Mm -hmm. 
So they're uh, like, Big Space replied, Big Space retweeted, Big Space is, and I'm like, w I'm like, Big Space did what? <laughs> so <laughs> it's been very interesting. And then I tried to reach out to them and couldn't because they didn't have a contact us on their website. It had some form, but it was like a form that you everyone would see on the web. So I tried, I went right to their registrar, and I was like, take this thing down now. And they were they were very pissed. <laughs> but uh, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do. At that point, you're like, this is crazy. But Twitter doesn't help you at all. Twitter's like, no. it's like this doesn't make sense. It's like it's gonna keep going. So that uh, that that's I don't know if that's gonna work for very much longer. But anyways, yeah. Good in advice. In recent years, I've been a a British fashion line called Hedonia. So I get tagged a lot on pictures of people wearing lovely dresses, which is fine. <laughs> <laughs> that's cool. Now um, I don't think Sean and um, Catherine and Renee did you guys answer this question? What's the best advice you would give someone for starting a blog? Because I know Michelle just did. And and what what do you wish you knew before you started? And then that will be what we'll end on. I think. Make sure you know what you're doing going into it in the sense that, you know, find the one thing that you truly want to do every day for the long haul because you will get tired, you will get frustrated, and you want to have the fire in the belly and the passion to keep it going because it's your thing. If you don't really know where your, what your tagline is, what your mission is, you're going to run out of steam. Yeah, sort of off of Sean's, I think that the best advice I... Someone said something to me years ago that said, you know, if you're going to end up being successful, you're going to do it because you're so specific. So whatever you do, especially when you begin, keep your focus narrow. I know that sounds like counterintuitive somehow, but if you're too broad, you're just like all over the place. You, you want to start narrow, and then you can grow when you get a bigger audience. Yeah, I agree. That's a great place to end on. Now, uh, first of all, I want to thank you guys for coming to the show. Now, if if people have questions, because this show will stay on YouTube, the show will stay on Google Plus for years to come. Can people send you guys questions to your username and like get some follow up answers? Oh Ask yeah. Them. Okay. Can you guys want to tell folks where they can find you on Twitter? Okay. Oh, um, <laughs> uh, I, I, I just got an email. I guess something I had to follow up, so I got a little distracted. Um, I am I'm a Twitter at me. You're on a show. You're on a live show. <laughs> <laughs> I am multitasking. That's a bad thing. I'm not gonna multitask in 2015. Um, my, my Twitter handle is niche n i c h e. Um, and my other Twitter handle for Cupcakes Take the Cake is actually Cupcake Blah because Cupcakes Take the Cake is too long. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was smart. I mean, at least you, at least you did it. You picked a name that was descriptive. That was smart to do. You know what? Uh, I think the Cupcake Blog is so great because it just—I mean—it tells you everything you need to know. Yeah. And it's about Cupcake Blog, so it's yeah. all there. Absolutely, Sean. What about you? Uh, two Twitter handles. My personal one is Hedonia, H-E-D-O-N-I-A, and then Punk Domestics is just at Punk Domestics, all one word. Um, yeah, and then you can reach me by way of Sean at SeanTimberlake.com. Cool. And then, uh, Catherine, where, where can people find you again? Everything from me, from YouTube to Instagram and on and on, is Weelicious, W-E-E-L-I-C-I-O-U-S. I gotta check out your videos. I I don't know how I've I know I'm subscribed to them, but I gotta check it out. Right, uh, Nichelle, are you on YouTube? Um, yeah, I have a YouTube. Okay, I'll check that out. <laughs> yeah. And Sean, you're on, you're on YouTube as well. I probably am. <laughs> I don't produce a lot of video content, although I do think that's a big deal for 2015. So I gotta that's get on. That's right. Excellent. Maybe we should do some kind of. Uh, we'll, have, we'll we'll definitely have you guys back on another kitchen party because we we would love come to have these conversations. Come on over. I, I I bring everyone in the kitchen. Come on. Hey. Oh, that's a good <laughs> idea. That would make a great topic to talk about how to dive into video and what do you yeah. use and how do you how do you do it if you're just one person and. Yeah, I I teach I do classes at uh, IACP and Blogger and everything. You don't need to spend as much money as you think. Okay. Well, I I think that's a new class. I mean, a new uh, kitchen party. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, thank you guys for joining us. Uh, if you're watching at that, home. Before we go, oh, can I just mention one more thing? On Twitter, yeah. um, uh, Chef Demetra Overton suggests that um, we check out a few food blogs that are discussing how to end childhood hunger. 
Um, it's such a, a, a wonderful cause. No kid, the hashtag is no kid hungry. Um, if you're not familiar with that, um, you might want to check that out because I can vouch for that. And uh, so she suggests doing that. Now, Renee, do you see that the moon moose, uh, Mo her name's Monica, which I've known for years, uh -huh. she said, Cupcake Blog, ha, I found one of the cupcakes I added to the Flickr account in 2008. And she actually posted a picture of it. <laughs> it's like this crazy cool, like, it's a psychedelic, it's body part cupcakes. It has an eyeball in the middle. If you guys check on Twitter, oh. you can see that. That okay. is pretty cool and pretty crazy. Um, and then Evie Abler, who is uh, actually invited her to see if she wanted to come on the show, she says, uh, please post that link on how to avoid the long dried bean process. Yes, I was just about to say that. I'm gonna, so a few people have tweeted about that, asking for Russ's recipe on beans, and I'm, I'm going to send that out right now. Excellent. I want to also... Kitchen party hashtag. I want to also thank the folks who, I know like we're like, we're going to end here, but I want to thank the folks who tuned in on Google+, Plus. Susie Anderson, Demetra Overton, um, Eric Deutsch, Cindy uh, Burkham, Alice Miser, a couple of names that are hard to, Monica Chase, uh, Alaskan Dermish, and, uh, and then a whole bunch, whole bunch more. But uh, we will save that for another time. So we'll see you guys in 2015. We have a whole new set of programming that's going to be starting up whole new kitchen parties that are also going to be starting up. Um, if you'd like to know more about Kitchen Party, go to our YouTube channel, which is Bake Space TV, and subscribe, and you will be the first to know our videos. So thank you, Nichelle, Sean, Catherine, for joining us, and Renee. I hope you guys all have a great New Year's. Happy New Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year. All right, guys, we will see you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.